stars, I will be there. I'm Monica Charette, and this is Holding the Light. As long as you love, I will whisper in your ear. Little whispers you will hear. As long as you When your child dies by suicide, it presents unique circumstances that can intensify and sometimes prolong and complicate the grieving process for parents. Tom Howard is slowly reassembling the pieces of his own shattered life after the loss of his son, Eli. He shares the mental health challenges his son faced, as well as his personal reflection on how men and women grieve differently, and yet how we all have to accept the unacceptable. You'll hear how we find strength in a 12-step program for grief recovery. Join us as Colby and I hold the light with Tom Howard. Colby and I are joined today by Tom Howard, who has graciously agreed to share the life and the loss of his son, Eli, and also share his unique experiences with grief from a father's perspective. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. We are connecting with Tom, who is in Steuben today, where he has gone to heroic lengths to make sure the conversation happens. And so uh, he's recording from a local library. So we want to thank them for their support and you, Tom, for getting time today for us and going the extra mile literally to be with us. So thank you. Thanks, Monica. Yeah. We learned about Tom and his son, Eli, after our interview with another grieving parent, Lisa Rylick. She encouraged me to connect with Tom, and um, Tom and Lisa co-lead a very powerful 12-step program for grieving parents, and we want to talk more about that in our podcast today. But first, we'd like to talk about Eli, your son, Tom. Tell us a little bit about his life and what you loved most about him. Loving a person and being a parent are perhaps two different things. (laughs) But my son was a person of contrasts. In fact, he was easily as impressive and, for that matter, hard to pin down as certain aspects of his growing up were terrifying. <laughs> so, so that's that's the gamut. In his lifetime, he was known as a supreme athlete. He was known as a compassionate person who seemed to reach out to underdogs and really help them out. And he was also a person with bipolar disorder who was taken down by the police department with uh, two loaded pistols and went to jail, presumably for domestic abuse, although I don't know that that was really proven. It was just an intense relationship. So the upshot is that there's a lot there. I noticed in one of the other podcasts that Mark said that he tends to compartmentalize. And I think that will actually have a lot to do with our discussion. If we're going to talk about the difference between fathers and mothers and how they grieve. I happen to see a lot of mothers grieve. And I know what that process looks like, at least in the case of, you know, four or five mothers and I think it's different for the different phases on, on, in which you can lose a child mm. because uh, it would probably be different to lose a baby than it is to lose a full-grown man. Definitely. I mean, we want to definitely get into that later, too, because you and I have shared a lot of thoughts about that. You also shared with me, and you alluded to it initially, about Eli's mental health challenges, and I wondered if you could tell us how that impacted your grief. I think the first thing I'll say is that when Eli was about 13 or so, but it might have been earlier, he had already been through anorexia of a form called uh, exercise bulimia. At that time, I remember confronting him. And in fact, I remember even where, or at least I remember a place associated with it. And I said, Eli, I know what you're thinking. And he looked at me kind of surprised. And I said, but I'll tell you this, you have to learn to trust the arc of your life. Don't try to leave early because you don't know where it's going yet. So even back when he was 13 or so, 
and after he had already tried to like basically exercise more than the amount of calories he was taking in to the point where he was he was not close to death but he was in he was in serious trouble hmm. i was already telling him stick around longer and what i mean about that is that i and and this is like after he died i realized that certain individuals and i and i think of people like Jimi Hendrix or Janis Joplin because they're public figures. But Eli was also a very public figure, which you'll find out if you don't know that already. In fact, he was always on Facebook creating his, his persona. And it was a multiple persona. It always had a different face. He was a preppy. He was a gangster. He was, you name it. You know, there, there just comes a time when you, you lose people, but you finally realize that the whole thing was a gift. But it's also part and parcel of recovery. We'll talk about that too. Yeah, we should tell our listeners too that Eli did die by suicide three years ago, correct? On May 1st. You just. Yeah. We're just passing that yeah. date, not that far back. Yeah. Yeah. And he was 33. Yeah. Something correct? about 33. I don't know what it is. You described him as a person who helped his suicidal friends, though, right? Yep. And you also. It was in your words you told me this, that he was both remarkable and tortured at the same time. What, what do you mean by that? Uh, from the age of seven. I mean, he was very happy baby, extremely happy, almost like ecstatically happy, you know. He's just a really happy kid and really surprised and enthralled with the world. And I should add that he really loved his dad and uh, admired him and basically would do anything that his dad did. I think part of his uh, passage in life was if, if dad can do it, then I can do it. <laughs> so, and indeed he did, but we could talk about that later. And grieving parents, as you know, especially those who have lost a child to suicide, talk about the stigma surrounding that. Have you experienced that in sharing Eli's story with other people? I had to talk for a minute about recovery. Nobody gets to recovery without experiencing the gift of desperation. They go to recovery because there was something unworkable about their life. And indeed, the first step is designed to mimic the uh, serenity prayer. And in fact, the serenity prayer says that I should learn to accept the unacceptable. So whether it's you, me, or anybody, if you never encounter any challenges in your life, you're not going to grow. You know, so the extent to which you ex encounter challenges is really the reason to be here. You might even go as far as to say to break your heart is to grow and it is to live and everything else is just gaining attachment everything before it is learning how to love things enough to care and then to lose them people places and things we are in fact all in recovery then sooner or later right it, it, it's like uh, there's a cute little saying in up in smoke by Cheech and chong who, the lady comes into the room, she's, you know, she's indignant that her kitchen is being used by these crazy people. And she says, well, I never. And, and one of the characters says, Joel, lady, you're going to be now. <laughs> so uh, to me, that's, that's, that's life. If you're not ready to accept the unacceptable, you're going to be sooner or later. So you were... Divorced from your wife at the time of Eli's passing. Mm -hmm. And you have another child, right? A living child, a daughter who's yep. older than Eli, April. What was that like trying to understand and process your own grief and support her and hers? Uh, what was it like at the time or what is it like now is two different questions. Absolutely. That's a yeah. good point to make. Yeah. So at the time, I... 
I mean, that comes to me in so many waves that I don't really know where to go with it. But it's worth me saying right now, right here and right now, that I grew up with two alcoholic parents. And I grew up in a household that I would describe as, at one time or another, completely filled with despair. And I had five brothers and sisters. So that that kind of impacts the whole, you know, the whole uh, nature of this, because there's me before recovery and there's me after recovery. And, and as you know, if you know anything about recovery, we never graduate from this program. <laughs> you never get like, okay, now I'm pretty smart and I'm not going to make any more mistakes. I promise, you know. Yeah, if only. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, um, when Eli died, I was going through my own kind of morass of situations that had to do with my relationship to a woman who was also having, what do you call it, mental wellness problems. I was pretty much in a state of shock already. And when my daughter called me, I was in Maine, not in Vermont, where he was. And, uh, and, and thinking back of uh, the times he contacted, like the last contact he had, was, hey, dad, you don't need any help over there. It's like, no, I'm all set at the moment. Boy, do I wish I had answered that question differently, right? But then again, I don't know if I had handled it right either, because actually this all has to do with COVID. It all happened just be just as COVID started and he lost his job. He was already on lithium. He knew this is this is the way I piece it together, anyways. He knew that if he could just get back on roofs, he was a successful. A roofing contractor, he could make lots of money and be and be and, and know he could support himself. But as it was, he had had a kind of a crash and um, was working for an exercise company, you know, like a gym. They up and closed their doors, and he's living in an apartment. And technically, we're all not getting near each other. And he does a roof for his um, his landlord. And realizes, except for the fact that he has no balance, which is one of the things that happens with lithium, apparently, he, he could be making money, supporting himself, he could be fine. He went off of lithium and five days later he's dead. And, and, and at that time, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get less strange. I can tell you that anybody I, that's in recovery in the bereavement group, I can tell you that none of them can explain their child's death, that it's just like defies their imagination. They can't do it. But anyways, as it concerns me, I got busy right away with the one thing that I knew that, um, that I could do. If we were not going to have a public service, then I needed to create a format right away for people to grieve. Yeah, so I decided that what I could do is create a Facebook page for Eli called Remembering Eli. That was a lifesaver right there. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. How did that help you? Uh, well, I mean, it gave me something to do because I, so I already had five Facebook pages or maybe it was four going at the time for different things. Because I'm out here in Maine and my family's all in Vermont, I felt that the best I could do mm -hmm. was to to create, I think before then I was probably a more private person. And when I came out here, I realized all alone. So the best I could do was to create a Facebook page for the building I was restoring and a Facebook page for the area, because it's a fascinating area associated with that, Acadia National Park. And, um, and a Facebook page for my former career as a restoration carpenter so anyways it was like okay this is just another page but all i had to do was like assemble every picture of eli now i took copious pictures when he was a child he became his own documenter afterwards with facebook you know this is what colby your generation knows that our generation just looks at it like are they all narcissists or, you know, what's the story here? Because we don't really, you know, it wasn't there for us in that way. You know, if a kid had a camera, he was a money lucky kid. And then he could wait, you know, someday my prince will come, so to speak. 
we actually did have a private ceremony by the water. Two days after he, he, he shot himself, I took that opportunity to make it a public page so everybody could input it. And they did. And here's the deal. I never realized how many people were keeping their eye on that guy. Not, see, uh, now I have to back up and say that when he was nine, he was already in his sister's high school productions. When he was 11, he was the fastest thing in, in Chittenden County, Vermont, but all of Vermont, as a middle schooler. He still holds the individual record by age group for the Burlington Marathon. He's the fastest thing out there for a 16-year-old. Yeah, I mean, this, this kid was amazing no matter what he did. And, and, and he wasn't just a kid, he was a man. And even there he was amazing because he went to jail, learned in jail that there's one thing that people who have been in jail can do when they get out and that's work for roofers because it's 130 degrees up on that roof. So they never ask you questions about where you've been or what you're doing or anything like that. They'll just hire you. So the same thing for pavement contractors. So he did with that company, the same thing I had done with my con con contracting career. Yeah. I'm actually a little curious from that Facebook page. Was there any particular stories or traits about Eli or something that maybe you learned that you hadn't known before that maybe filled you with joy or made you uh, delighted to see something that surprised you? Yeah, well, one of them was I didn't know that he held the record for the Burlington Marathon. I knew he was fast, you know, I just but he had always been fast. And in, in middle school, they start the race. Right. And Eli be somewhere in the pack. But somewhere in the middle of the race usually comes back around, he'd be in front. But then at the end of the race, you just sit there for five minutes and wait for the other kids to come in. So that was part of his character too, really, that, you know, it's like, Eli, why do you run so fast? He said, well, I thought somebody was chasing me. So that was part of that bipolar, part of that anxiety, that feeling that, that I got I to gotta run faster. That was part of his psychological makeup. So let's talk about this now. You and I had earlier conversations, you know, and I want to be clear that we understand that everyone grieves differently and in different time frames, and there's no right or wrong way to grieve. But do you think men and women grieve differently? And why do you think that? Well, first of all, I joined some grief groups at the time. And, and I think that a lot of focus in grief groups is is different than probably what a man knows how to handle. A man wants to be in charge. They want to, so just like their organs, men are out there and women are in there. Women are relational, men are tool oriented. So they just do things differently, but you take it another step further. So what I've noticed as a result of, of like I'm the only man that attends the, the 12 step group, right? What I notice is that woman, women want to do something that men, or I should speak for myself, but most men probably wouldn't want to. They want to cry during the session. They want the safety of the container, which is recovery, because it has rules about communication. It has a format. It has uh, kind of what I'll call prompts, especially the way we've set up our group. Now, mind you, we're not supposed to talk about this on uh, press, radio, TV as part of the, the traditions. But this group is so weird. Anyways, because we don't use what's called conference approved literature. We use poems that are just out there, but we also use a, um, a grief recovery meditation book. So we draw from that reading for the day. We draw from a poem that's pre-selected and I've written poems for it, but typically Lisa selects them or somebody else submits one. But the point is, what's interesting is how they end up overlapping. Because I, if I can't address emotionally the way that I feel at that moment, the poem and the reading help me get there. And guess what? Uh, at one time, I read five recovery meditations a day, one for codependents, one for uh, alcoholics, 
one for um, Alanonics is what we what I call them, one for men's recovery. And I and I could synthesize the way that those five recovery meditations for the day were like. So that's how you understand what recovery is, as opposed. So you go back to the question you asked me earlier. It's like what what part does recovery play in this? It's like, well, <laughs> it's just like the you know the serenity prayer. How are you going to learn to accept the unacceptable? How are you going to accept what the first step, which which says you're not in control? You're not in control of alcohol. You're not in control of anything. You pretend you're in control. We all take our minds and we project upon what we see out there. The mind is not a computer, it's a projector. We see what we think about things. And then we try to make it fit, (laughs) which is, you know, in other words, what is our relationship to reality? As good as our ability to accept reality. So it's all about acceptance. And, um, you know, we're only as good as whatever training we got. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I I feel like we should backfill just a little bit because we were going to talk a little bit later about the 12 step program. So my listeners might be going, wait, what is this about? Can you tell us a little bit about that, how it started and what it is today for you? Sure. At that time, I was going to um, a local hospice group And I was wanting to talk one way about grief recovery. And they were wanting to talk a different way about it. And I ended up not being welcome in that group. So I went to um, Lisa. She was just starting out with recovery in a deeper way. Um, When we had a a group that we had started, there was just a kind of a a, a rehash of of a group that happens earlier on Sunday mornings about basically what is 12 steps, readings, so on and so forth, particularly and primarily in the big book. I went to her and I said, I think this is a wonderful format for what we have to do as parents. And indeed, anybody would have to do for the loss of a loved one. Because on some level, it's unacceptable. You can't go there, you know, you know, your mind will say, if you really, truly love that person, it's like, well, you take them out. Why don't you just take me out, too? Because I I don't want to be here anymore. You know, on some level, um, I think that's that's the problem we have. And for that matter, how am I with my own death? Because. If you lose every th- the things that you love a little at a time, then that's a precursor to losing everything you will lose. But why is it, do you think, a lot of men don't want to seek that conversation mm-hmm. to process the loss? goes back to the tools. They just want a tool to fix it. So, like, they really, really want to get their hands around something that will take away their discomfort. Whereas women are relational. They want to go there. They want, they want to feel that vulnerability. They want to take it in. Men, get it out of here. Please just get it out of here. That's our bodies talking. And we have been set up for different things. Women to nurture, men to be sent to war. But really, if you send men to war, women are going to be part of it sooner or later because that war is going to be on somebody's soil. So... This is, this is our part of the Mars and Venus equation. Women are from Venus, men are from Mars. Men want to war, women want to relate. Yeah, that was actually going to be my, uh, that was going to be my question is, you know, if, if these things are recognizable um, and we can identify them and, you know, obviously it doesn't mean that group therapy is the one and only way, but how do we encourage men to put themselves into positions where they might feel a little uncomfortable, but ultimately find, um, you know, a way to heal, whether it be a group session or like one-on-one therapy or um, even just like maybe journaling their own emotions to start or something small like that. How do we encourage them? How do we reach them in today's society? Right. Well, you put your finger right on it. Men have to be encouraged into being vulnerable, just like they have to be encouraged. Turns out you can take 
any child and make them into a soldier. But I think in the case of men, there's an interesting thing that happens. And I, I can't help but relate this because it's important. In recovery, you have to listen to other people's pain without comment. You can't fix that either. <laughs> you have to listen to other people's desperation, you know, and in the process, you start to realize you're not an oddball. You are a human or better yet, you're a spirit going through a material experience. You are, you have no choice but to break your heart here, but you never wanted to admit it. And boys are worse at it. Women bleed from a very young age. Men think they'll just go on forever. You know, old soldiers don't die, they just fade away. Well, by the way, these are my answers, not your answers, right? But they're interesting answers, right? Because there's a real question there. Why are, if we're all humans, then why can't we just love each other? Getting into some deep stuff that is, you know, sideways to being a father, losing a child, but it all goes to the same place. Yeah, you know, the, the important thing for me always, because I've experienced this with my own husband and, of course, Colby in a much different sense, but what's so important for me and I've learned is that each person feels like their grief is accepted and supported by each, by each other. That's, I think that is really the bottom line. So uh, an additional thought in that, in that sequence, when I, when I do recovery... I end up feeling like crying. And this is not a comfortable feeling for men. You know, it's just it's just too soft for the way that a man thinks that he needs to be in the world. But, and this is my interpretation. But I will say, this is the one thing that I'm willing to do in my group is to go there with women because I think it helps them complete their process. Oftentimes, men are compartmentalized and they're not gonna they 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 they're there i mean they're like like you know honey yeah, i'm i'm hurting too but they're not going to go there in that same way they don't like they don't like to to hold that much pain in it publicly couldn't agree more i don't know if this stuff is is you know useful or not cuz you know what i had to do when writing down about eli i really had to summing up everything that Eli was. And it's, it's a mess. And I try to rewrite it before it's like, it wasn't enough time it, or, or categorize it or, you know, then this is a man again, too. It's like, you know, well, if I can just figure out how to fake this stuff, you get it just so, I, okay, well, let's talk about his child. You know, it doesn't, it's messy. Yeah. Well, grief is messy mm. as we all know. I noted, too, in Eli's obituary, which was so beautifully written, by the way. Did you write that? <laughs> that was interesting. So I'm friends with uh, my ex-wife, which helps, right? In, in other words, our, our divorce was not easy. But the way she approached it, I, I didn't have anything to complain about, per se. You know, she's, she, she was not trying to fight me. She was trying to give me things. You know, just not the rest of her life, right? We met next to the river. We lived next to the Huntington Gorge uh, in, in Vermont, uh, which is a beautiful place. The kids grew up there. My ex-wife, my daughter, and I met down by the river because you know, I like the river, you know. And at some point, my ex-wife says, uh, both my ex-wife and my daughter, who had actually been kind of on the front lines of Eli's uh, mental illness. I actually exited partially because of Eli at the time of the divorce. I saw that we weren't getting along and I felt that I just need to let everybody heal however they're going to do it. But but as it relates to that um, obit, Meg is my ex-wife and April's my daughter. Meg and April say to me, you write the obit. Now, mind you, 
because I'm a ACOA, adult child of alcoholics, anything I'm asked to do, I'll probably do it. <laughs> but what was funny is that, so I kind of started on this. And by the way, Eli, he was cremated within two days of his being, of his dying. And so we actually sent the ashes away down the river within a few days. But during that period, I, I know I started on the process. Typical of my ex-wife, she wrote the whole thing, but it was angry. Hmm. So what ended up happening is I became the editor of what she wrote because I had to take out the barbs and leave the love. And I, and I also had my own things to say in there. And basically she wrote it, but you understand as women, they were both still very much in pain with a certain amount of resentment for everything that they had gone through with mental illness. It's not pretty. It was not easy. Uh, it all, a lot of it fell on them. I thought it was beautifully written and I, I'd like to include it in our show notes for people to read because I was, it just brought me to tears. Yeah. Well, on Remembering Eli, if you go into the community comments, you're going to meet a man that will probably drop your jaw to the carpet. He, um, just such a fascinating guy, kind, loving, and yet would demons enough to end up being a bit of a demon, you know, at times it was complex. <laughs> yeah. And, but what you'll see is everybody loved that guy, loved him, <laughs> not just liked him, loved him, you know, for different reasons. And I would, incidentally, I will walk away from this. I know we're getting towards our time. I will walk away from this and I probably won't be able to do much today. So that's another part of recovery. Like it just hits you where you live, you know, I don't know. Well, thank you for sharing that because not a lot of people don't understand that whether you're a man or a woman, it's emotionally draining to re revisit this. Yeah. If you will go to where that pain is, it will cleanse you, but it will hurt you first. So, Tom, as we always do, if you're familiar with our podcast, in closing, we would ask you to share with us how you would like us to remember your son, Eli. Well, first of all, I'd say go, go, go to Remembering Eli Howard, because that's, that's on Facebook. Uh, that's going to be the easiest way, because for one thing, um, there's how he wanted to be seen. It seems to me he was constructing his post-mortem the whole time. Maybe we all are. I don't know. As for my son, uh, I think raising a child is, um, is being given a, a mirror and that mirror will have reflections that you do and don't want to see. But I will say that he was a loving man and a loving child. And um, like me, he always works too hard. Thank you, Tom, so much for sharing your story and for helping us all take another small step to accept the unacceptable and find peace in our grief journeys together. We appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. Thank you both. As long as you love. Thank you so much for listening. If you found this podcast helpful, please share our link with others and subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. I'm Monica Charette, reminding you that you are never alone in your grief. Until next time, we'll be right here with you, holding the light. As long as you love.